Hi. So welcome to Math 344, Mathematics of Sports. This is lecture 14. We're going to you know, do coding and backgame and basically get close to wrapping this area up. So several of you have sent me some thoughts. What I want to do is I want to have a discussion about ways to attack this problem, ways to try to gather data. I'll share a little bit of my code. And then if people want to talk about their code, I'll open it up for that. And I will also talk about some related, interesting theoretical problems that arise in what we're doing. And I will you know, leave some of this as an exercise. I'll do maybe some special cases in class just to start and then leave you, how would you try to generalize this uh, in the future? Okay, so what I wanna do now is I wanna shift to, um, let's see. So I want to shift to this. So let me stop the share, and I'll share over here. Okay. So hopefully, people is the text large enough that people can read. Okay. So what I want to do is talk about the code that I wrote to try to investigate the backgammon problem. I'll go through my thought process. I'll talk a little bit about some of the modifications one can do some of the cheats I've done to make it work a little bit better and the model I used. So we talked before about saying, maybe this is you know, 100 points or 1,000 points you need. And if you have 600 points, you need another 400 to win. And we talked about if we have 1,000 points left with you know, 40 with your chip and four, I'm sorry, 400 with your chip and 600 for the others, if we just look at all possible permutations of those, then you will win 60% of the time because you'll get to your 40, your 400 before the other person gets to their 600. Are we all comfortable with that? And the really simple analysis was, it just comes down to what is the last item. If the last item is your chip, you lose because you went to the very end and the other person got theirs first. If the last one is theirs, then you win. So what I'm going to do in the code today is a slightly different model which I think is a little bit better. Maybe not though. Uh, backgammon is one of the games that can go on forever. Can somebody give me a game that is definitely finite? Chess. Chess. Why is chess finite? There are two invariants. Every key moves so up. I want the two invariants. So I want them with two invariants unless you treat the number of tumbles remaining or number of pieces. Okay. And they're only finite to make tumbles. Okay, the way I've always done it in chess is if you have a threefold repetition of the board state, then the game is automatically a draw. And so given that there's only finally many pieces, even with promotions, there's only finally many possibilities, you will eventually have a threefold repetition or somebody will win. Chess is a finite game. Can somebody give me a game that could be infinite? Baseball. Baseball, right? As George Cousins, it, we can have so much, we never know when it's going to end. You know, football will end no matter what, even if we have to go to, what do you go to in football to end it? Sudden death, right? George Collin has a great routine about the differences between baseball and football, and just the language. I'll, I'll try to remember to share that. Baseball could go on forever. Backgammon could go on forever. You know, tic-tac-toe, thankfully, is very finite. You, know, you are not stuck playing tic-tac-toe for too long. So here's a possible model for backgammon. At each moment in time, you flip a fair coin. If it's a plus one, you increase player one's total by one. If it's a minus one, you increase player two's total by one. And you keep playing until somebody hits a fixed amount of points. It is possible that the game would never end. But with high probability, you know, we have basically a random walk. With high probability, you know, the average value will be you know, zero, but the fluctuations will be growing on the order of the square root of the number of tosses. So with extremely high probability, the game will end and we can even give you some bounds onto how long you must wait. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to just try to model a very simple situation. So I'm gonna do num do iterations. I have a probability of doubling and I have a probability of accepting. And I will do it so that Every person is always going to have the same probability of your know, doubling. If the probability of winning reaches this point, I will double. And when you have to decide whether or not you want to accept, if the probability of you know, the person who doubled winning is below a certain critical threshold, you will accept. 
And you have to decide what this is. I'm going to say it's the same for the two players. You could, of course, have player one and player two having different thresholds. So maybe if it's a 60% chance of my winning, I'm going to double. And as long as it's no longer, no more than 70% chance of my losing, I'll accept the double. Something like that. So is everybody clear on? If we have something like this, it seems like we're going to be in the situation where you're never going to wait too long to double, or those will be very easy cases to analyze. I'm not going to double until it reaches 80%. And we can see what's going to happen. Well, you're not going to double until 80%. It's probably not in my best interest to accept, so I will probably just decline. The analysis will become easy. The first question I have is, let's say you need 100 points to win. OK? If you have 80 points, what's the probability you get 20 points before the other person gets um, 80 points. So I, 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 let me finish this. I'm setting it up so that if player one reaches 100, they win. If you reach zero, if you reach 100, player one wins. If you reach zero, player two wins. You could, of course, do it more symmetrically. You could go from negative 100 to 100. I just chose to do it this way. So if you have the value of the board at 50, What's the probability player one gets to 100 before player two gets to zero? Fifty percent, you know, right in the middle, complete <laughs> symmetry. But what if you have 80 points? What's the probability you get up to 100 before you get down to zero? What do you think the answer should be? Yes. So are you saying that it's just like a, a it, oh, this thing is being counted and it'll get incremented or by one decremented right by at one. every moment in time we toss a coin so like, we probably one half we go up by one we probably one half we go down by one it technically could go on infinitely but it probably won't it, right almost so, surely it won't then i would think you need to do an infinite sum where like and that's exhausting to do an infinite yeah, sum you have to choose it would, it would look like a choose function where you're right. choosing 100 but the hope is as you have more and more terms, the contribution is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And with high probability, after a very large number of terms, we should return to zero. But if 100 is what you need to reach for player one to win, and zero is what you need to reach for player two to win, if you're at 80 points, what do you think the probability is that player one wins if you're at 80? 80%. What do you think it is if it's at 93? 93%. Right? That's something we would have to prove. Fortunately, I am a pure mathematician. I know how to prove stuff like this. But you know, the first thing I did is I just wrote some computer code. And I just you know, wrote some code over here to just simulate, hey, let's just do some number of iterations. And let's just see if I start at a given point, how often do I end up? So I started off with you know, 100 points, starting off with 0.5. And you know, I did 10,000 iterations. And I saw player one one about 49% of the time. Okay, That was pretty good. I then did, you know, 72% um, is where I was going to start. And I saw player one won 71.73% of the time. I then had to start at 87% and I saw player one won 87.26% of the time. This is not a proof, but it makes it very likely that I haven't made a mistake. And if you're at 93 points and you need to get 100, 93% of the time you will get to 100. So I thought this was a, interesting way to try to model backgammon. We could also do it with, you know, we know how many moves are left, that doesn't allow for an infinite game, this does allow for an infinite game. All right. And so then I wanted to try to figure out what is going to be the value for winning. And it'll be interesting to see and discuss with everybody else. So I'm just having a bunch of places where I'm storing things in many different ways. So results is going to just be a string of the result from each game, net results, is I'm going to just, for all the times I do this, I'm going to just store the value, how much did player one get? Always, 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 I do things from the perspective of player one. Uh, one win will just count how many times player one wins, two win will count how many times player two wins. I am going to make some simplifying assumptions. I will always assume that the first person who doubles is player one, right? Because we don't really care about how we got to the position where somebody doubled. 
What we care about is who doubles first, who doubles second. So player one is really the first player to double, not necessarily the first player in the game. Now the next thing is when I'm looking at the code, I'm gonna start my score at you know, 50%. Your points win is how many points I need to win. I'll start halfway there. Uh, probability of winning is the score divided by points win. Uh, the value of the game is initially going to be one. Uh, who can double is initially one. So, um, okay, so I'm setting it up so player one is going to double. And now I'm gonna change things a little bit over here. This would be how I would start the game normally and I would just let the game play. And I would just play until we reach the threshold when somebody finally gets to the percent where they double. Let's say it's 60%. How many of you have written code that took a while to run? So anything we can do to save time is better. Do I really give a shit about how much time I spent before I got to the point where somebody doubled? Let's just jump to the good part. You know, let's just fast forward and jump to the good part. So I'm gonna just immediately move to a configuration where uh, the score is the probability that I double times the number of points you need to win. So I immediately move to the point where player one is, where we're gonna have our first double. Is everybody comfortable with that? It just saves time and I don't have to go through all of the other stuff. So I'm going to assume I've now jumped to the point in the game where player one is able to double and they double and now player two has to decide whether or not they want to accept. If you look at the code, I have a lot of variables. I have num do, which is the number of iterations I'm gonna do, not a big deal. P double is the probability that I double. So if, if my chance of winning is this value, I will double. P accept is the probability that somebody accepts the double. I will assume these are the same for the two players. You could of course have different values and you play various games like this. Uh, points win is how many points you need to win. You know, you can do maybe 10, 100, 1,000, you have your choice. Later we'll see there might actually be better numbers than 10, 100, 1,000. And then the last one is print. So this is a coding trick that I've used for years that I really like. So I will have print for the most part be either one or zero as an input. If print is one, then I print out all of my values at various points in the program, which helps me do debugging. Is there anybody here who is so damn good that they don't make any errors when they code? Damn it, I was hoping one of you could give me lessons. All right, we all make errors when we code. And so you put in a bunch of print statements to print things out. Well, if you're doing things a huge number of times, you don't wanna print everything out. And so what I can do is if the value of print is one, then just print everything out. And if the value of print is zero, don't print anything out. You could of course have multiple values. If the value is um, three, print out anything three and higher. If it's two, print out anything two and higher or whatever way you want to do it or print your know, three and lower. I think probably three and lower would be the way to do it. So zero, you print nothing. One, you print just the ones. Twos, you print the twos and the ones. And then you can have various things showing. So, okay, this part of the code is working. So I'm gonna not print out anything there. It's a really nice trick to do. So now um, I've initialized the score to be the point where player one doubles. So player one now doubles. And so here's how it goes. While the score is greater than zero and the score is less than points that I need to win. Okay, so that means the game hasn't ended yet. And so now player one can double, the game is initialized to be worth one, player one doubles. I've calculated the winning percentage. I've got my print statement that will print out everything if it equals one, just so I can see, is the code running the way I expect it to? And a couple of times, oh, it's not. And so now, uh, if the probability of winning is greater than equal to the probability of double, and who can double is one, so player one can double, because I'm allowing us to go through the loops many times when many people can double, then if, if the probability of winning is greater than the probability of accepting, player two is going to decline. So let's say player two will only accept if the probability that player win wins is at most 70% and player one is doubling when they have an 80% chance. Player two would say, no, thank you. I declined the double. And so what happens is I will immediately add the, the value of the game to results. I'll increment the number of wins by one by one. I will store that also, I'll add that to the value of net results to just keep a running tab of 
where I am. And then score is points win plus 100. That's just so far above my threshold that it's going to exit me out of this while loop. You know, I'm only doing this while my score is between zero and points win. By adding 100 to the maximum value, I know I'm going to exit and break out of the loop. Or what could happen is I could be in a situation where the probability of winning is less than the probability of accepting. So player two is gonna say, I'll take that double. And so now in that case, the value of the game is now twice as much. And now I change who can double to two. And so now player two can double. And again, I have a you know, little print statement here that if I wanna do some debugging, just print that player two has accepted. So now I go and check and see, does player two want to double? And so it's almost identical code as before. I had no desire to make this into a separate function that I pull in. I cut and paste it because I want to be able to just look at the code and see what's going on. So I'm always doing things from the perspective of player one, so we can make things a little bit confusing. So if one minus the probability of player one winning is greater than the probability of doubling, and player two has the doubling cube, then they now double. And now I check to see you know, if the probability of winning for player one is too small, they're going to decline. And so now player two wins. I add to results negative value gain because player one lost. I'm always doing things from the point of player one. And I now set the score to be negative 100, so far below zero that it's going to force me to exit the loop. And now the other possibility is if player one accepts the game, the value of the game is now doubled. Who can double is now back to player one. Yes. With the way that this is written, would it allow for like player one to double and then player two double before the, there's another? It technically would allow that to happen before anything goes on. And so player two can immediately double after player one. And in fact, there's a whole slew of terms involving various animal names, uh, beaver and raccoon, I, I, I forget exactly what it is, where you can immediately double the double. And I think you still get to control the doubling cube. And then I think the person can also immediately accept the double of the double of the double. You know. And so I'm, I'm trying to keep things simple. But yes, this does allow, I'm going to assume that player two is not going to double when they're in a losing position. And player one is not going to double when they're in a losing position. So that while it is technically possible, uh, we're not going to have a redouble here. The, the reason things can happen is you could have disagreements over what is the relative probability of winning. And that's where things get interesting. If you calculate things differently, you might actually think that was a bad double. I'm going to accept it. And I'm going to redouble it back. Um, I don't think you would redouble if, well, I'll, I'll leave it like that. Now, what I could do is this would now allow uh, player one to double in the future. They're the one who now owns the double cube. What should I do if I don't want player one to ever be able to double again? Yes. You set it to some other number. Yeah, set it to anything other than one or two, such as three. And now all of a sudden I can now adjust my code so that there's at most two doubles, a double and a redouble later. So, you know, again, you want to have your code as flexible as possible. All right. And so, you know, since I'm the professor, I don't have to do all the detailed analysis. I just have to do enough so that you guys can do the detailed analysis. And now I'm actually going to do my game move. I'm going to choose a random number um, between zero and one. That's the random bracket. And if it's less than 0.5, I'm going to say that that was a plus one. I'm going to increase the score by one. If it's not, I'm going to decrease the score by one. And now I check to see, have I reached points that player one needs to win? And if so, I'm going to declare player one the winner. I will increment everything accordingly. And I'm going to add 100 to the score to just make sure I exit the loop. Then I'll check to see if the score equals zero. And then player two wins, and I increment things accordingly. And then the rest is just, I now just you know, print out you know, a bunch of things. And so uh, it took me about 16.7 seconds to run you know, 10,000 simulations. Um, I'm, I've got things set up so that because I'm cheating a little bit, I want my probabilities to be nice integers. 
So uh, a nice rational number. So my probabilities are 70 out of 195 out of 100. So if player one wins 70 out of 100 times, that's when they're going to double. And player two will accept as long as the probability of player one winning is no more than 95 out of 100. And so when I did this, I found that player one won 69.95% of the time. Good. You know, they doubled at a point in the game when they were supposed to win 70% of the games from that point onward. So the fact that I'm seeing 69.95%, that's a reasonable <laughs> number to see. It's a expectation that I'm doing everything correctly. Again, whatever possible, when you code, you want to be able to have some quick tests to see, can I trust the output? You know, do I think I did this right? You know, especially when you're coding around you know, 2, 3 a.m., you know, it's quite likely you've made a mistake. Yes? Is this game starting even? So this game is starting even, but I only start caring once player one gets to that 70%. So I'm looking at games that have evolved and hit 70%. And that's the first time something like this has happened. So I'm not starting at the beginning. When I did that, it actually was always 50-50. I'm just saving time and just jumping to this point. How many have heard of you know, chaos? The mathematical concept, not roommates. And so one of the great examples of where chaos was discovered was Lorenz was looking at trying to model weather. And he had a very simple model and he was trying to look at some simulations. And the computer would print out what was going on. And he saw something looked interesting. And so he decided to just put in those values and just run the code again from that point. And you know, there was no reason to start at the beginning and wait for all of it to reach that point. Let me just jump to that point and start right there. And when he put the values in and he ran the <laughs> program, even though he was using deterministic differential equations, he got very different answers very quickly. He's like, wait, this, this can't be. It's a deterministic process. And then what he noticed is the computer was internally storing six values, six decimal values, but the printout was only three digits. Well, you know, I mean, off oh, by one part in 10,000, that's not a big deal. It was enough. It was this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And so with those very small changes, uh, he very quickly got uh, wildly different responses, and a lot of great stuff was discovered from this. You want to be thinking very carefully about everything that's going on. What am I storing? How am I storing it? How am I going to use it? Have I stored everything I want? As a rule of thumb, I save everything I can when I'm running because I don't know what's going to be useful. Years ago, I was do doing some math research in additive number theory, and I finally found a set that had a very interesting property. Unfortunately, I didn't save the set. I saved what A plus A plus A was. And so can I deduce what the set was? It turns out it was just easier to run the code again and just pray that I was not extremely lucky. It's something that could normally take a year. I happened to get in the first you know, 10 minutes. And that was the case. You know, it was something that there were many, many examples. I was lucky. But I was being careless in the coding, and I forgot to save A. I just saved the final output. Here was what A plus A plus A was. So when you write your code, save everything because you don't know what you're going to need. I'm saving all of the results, every single game. I can print that out. I can make a history of them. I can see everything. I can see how many times do I have a game that takes on a really large value. So there's a lot more analysis you can start to do to see how likely is it that I'm going to get you know, these really big, wild swings. You know, how likely will I be to have multiple times I go all the way up to 70% chance of winning, then down to 30, then back up to 70, then down to 30. How likely is it for that to happen? Well, it seemed like it did happen and that's going to lead to a huge game. And unfortunately, when you're doing stuff like this, if you have a very small sample space, one wildly absurd result can make a huge difference. And you could actually just have really bad data that I might not trust. You know, 10,000 may not be enough because I might just get really lucky or unlucky and happen to see something. Do you think if, uh, let's say, Elon Musk decides to send one of his kids to Williams and they ask if they can switch into 344 in the midst of the semester, what would we say? 
Of course, we're Williams College. We work with all students. We help everybody equally get up to speed. Do you think if that happens that the average income of your guardians will change significantly in this class? Or look at the average income of guardians. What about the median income of guardian? No, the median income is not gonna change that much, but the average income, if it doesn't please, as I always tell my students, talk to me after class, if that would not change the average in this classroom by that much. If it would actually lower things, let me know, right? If we happen to have just one really anomalous gain, maybe it's something that happens once in a million, but we happen to get it in our 10,000 trials. The question is, how much do you need to be confident? Well, the more simulations I run, the more confident I am. And so 10,000 may not be enough. And so this took 16.7 seconds to run. And the average value was, you know, if I look at the net results per the number of games, was 1.53. So I can run this again. And this should take um, about 16.7 seconds, I believe. The program was still in memory. I should probably have just rerun the last one beforehand. And we'll see how close is it to 1.5. Now, I really should have run it below here to just keep these results and not overwrite them. It's going to overwrite them right now in you know, just a few more seconds. But this gives you just some sense of how to do the coding. And then I can do this. I can plot this for lots of different values of p except and p double. And, you know, oh, sorry, p double and p except. And just see what do I get. Uh, it's still computing. It feels like it's been more than 16 seconds. And it's definitely saying, you know, input 146. So I'm a little surprised it has not finished running by now. And so what I could do is I can make a, like a contour plot, or I can make like a two-dimensional table of looking at lots of different values of P double and P except and see how things are. I, at this point, I feel like it has definitely been more than 16.7 seconds. Uh, what's nice is because, okay, well, so 34.56, that's twice as much. Strange. Okay, and so now the net results was about 0.5. It was about 1.5 last time. That's a pretty sizable change. All right, so it's, it was only out of a half a second. So what I will do, is this time I'll just you know, paste it over here and just run it again. And so we now know that this is gonna take on the order of about half a minute, hopefully. I'm surprised that this happened, yes. So is it saying that given that the game gets to 70% in favor of player one, on average, it's getting doubled again, which means that it's fluctuated all the way to 70% in the other direction? Yes, that, like, that, there's good, that there's a lot of games that it gets doubled again. And again, because we're moving, you know, we're moving discreetly, but we're moving in steps of size one. We can't get to a, um, how many points we're doing, 100 points or zero points without going through 70 or going through 30. And so by symmetry, why not just start and say, hey, look, we have some fluctuations in the beginning. Eventually, we either get to 70 or 30. If we get to 30, just flip things around and change who the players are so that we always assume and again, just make life a little bit easier. And so it shouldn't really matter that I am, you know, not starting the game at you know 50, that I'm starting the game at 70 because I'm changing who player one and player two are. Right. I there we go. I was about to say that should have been about. And so now here we have the net result is negative. And so the question is, is the code correct? And then the other thing is, if the code is correct, is 10,000 just small enough that there's going to be some serious fluctuations? This is one of the reasons why I was plotting the histograms, because for a lot of these things, uh, one small result <laughs> can make a huge difference. So there's your know, big result over here. Maybe that's really driving things down. Uh, how many know the strategy double plus one in roulette? I might do a lecture on that. So you know, the strategy is, you bet a dollar on red. If red comes up, you win a dollar. If not, you're down a dollar. So you bet $2 on red. If red doesn't come up, you're down $3. So you bet $4. And you keep doing this, and eventually you will get a red and win. We'll talk maybe later in the semester as to why this does not work. You know, I'm not here at Williams College because I love teaching so much that I'm willing to 
you know, decline going to Vegas and making a fortune if this has no flaw. And I have not already gone to Vegas and made a fortune and dressing like this and doing stuff like this. There is a issue with this. But what is interesting is that a lot of people could play the strategy and win a small amount of money. And then there'll be a few people who will lose a tremendous amount of money. So we could have something like that going on here. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about some of the theory and I will turn it over to the rest of the class for, um, uh, to talk more about the back end. Okay. So hopefully this will work. Okay. So what we want to do now is we want to study, um, let's say here's zero, here's some number N. We're at K over here. And my question is, given at K, and each turn go up one with probability one half or down one with probability one half. What is the probability we hit N before we hit zero? So is everybody clear? We start at K, we, at each turn we toss a fair coin and we either go to K plus one or K minus one. And then if we're at K minus one on the next turn, we either go to K or K minus two and so on and so on. What's the probability we hit N before we hit K, before we hit zero? So does anybody want to give me a conjecture? K over N. So the conjecture is the probability is K over N. That's the most natural thing. You know, I'm, if, you're, if say N is 100 and K is 80, I'm 80% 80 of the way there, I should be able to finish this. Has anybody seen this problem before? Okay, so I love this problem. Um, I haven't seen it for years. And so the question is, how would you start attacking this? Can anybody give me any easy values of N? Remember, you can be a smart ass. Two. Two. Is that the easiest value of N? I think so. I mean, if we start off with N equals one, then you're either starting where you've already won or you've already lost, right? N equals one, it's already over. So I, I, I do think N equals two is the easiest case. All right, oops. All right, so here we go. So here is zero, here's one, here's two. If we're at two, what's the probability that we win? 100%. If we're at zero, what's the probability we win? 0%. If we're at one, what's the probability we win? 50%, why is it 50%? Okay, well that, that, that's what the conjecture is, but why is the answer 50%? Game ends in one Game ends in one toss. So game ends in one toss. Win with probability one half, lose with one half. So we can actually just analyze this directly. One toss is enough to end everything. There's another way you could argue that it's 50%. How else could you argue that it's 50%? By symmetry. Right? There's no way it could be anything other than 50%. Right? If I had an 80% chance of getting to two before getting to zero, we'll just change all the plus ones to minus ones. 
So is everybody comfortable with the case n equals two? So we're counting. We first did maybe n equals one, then we did n equals two. What should we do next? Think about it. Don't 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 shout it out. Think for a moment. What should we do next? One, two. All right. Can somebody give me a candidate for what we should do next? There's at least two natural candidates. Three or four. Do you want to brave and choose one? I think four is more natural. I think four is, is the more defensible choice. So let's think about what's going on with n equals four. Here's zero, here's four, here's two, here's one, here's three. We know 100%, 0%. What else do we know? Good, why is two 50%? So this is symmetry. Now we've got to figure out one and three. So how can you figure out one and three? Um, you break it up into two smaller cases. Okay. So since we already know what it would be for zero to two, to yep. one, you can just take that result and then for two to four, you just subtract two from each of them and then it's the same thing. Well, so, so how would I figure out, let's say the probability of three is X. What should the probability of one be? One minus X by symmetry. So I want to figure out what X is. How can I figure out X? Can you give me an equation for X? Yes. Well, you're going to do one flip and it goes in player one's favor. It's a hundred percent. Good. So, so good. So if I get a head, I win. If I get a tail, so now I'm at four. Now I'm at two. And what's the probability that I win if I'm at two? 50%. And that's going to be three fourths or 75%. So we're able to figure out what it is at three. And by symmetry, we can get that one has to be 25%. We could analyze three. So here's zero, here's one, here's two, here's three. We know this would be 100%, 0%. If we call two X, what would one be? One minus X. And in fact, I think I'm using green for this. And we could do something very similar. So X would be one half of the time we're at three and we win, or one half of the time we're at one, and what's the probability we win at one? One minus X. This should be kind of almost reminiscent of the geometric series game. So we get X, I'm hitting that. So we get X equals one half plus one half minus X. So it's gonna be one minus one half X. Yes. Therefore, three halves X equals one, Therefore, x equals two thirds. So we get two thirds here and one third here. So we actually can do three without too much trouble. So we've now done one, two. Sorry about this. Hello? Uh, no, I could the heat is not working in my house. And so I have to make sure that if they call about you know, fixing the heat, this is a good time of year to have the heat working. Otherwise you may be seeing some little millers scampering through the building later tonight. Okay, so we've done one, two, three, four. What should we do next? Five is defensible. What else is defensible? 
I don't think six is defensible. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I will rumble with you on six. I will rumble with you on 10. Eight, I will not rumble on. So we could, we could build things up inductively. How many people have seen proofs by induction? How many people have not seen proofs by induction? So I would say either n equals five or n equals eight is the next case to do. And so if I do n equals eight, I've got zero, four, eight, six, two, and then I have one, three, five, seven. I know zero is zero percent, eight is a hundred percent, four is fifty percent. From what we did before, six is going to be seventy-five percent, and two would be twenty-five percent. And now I have to start trying to figure out how do I do seven, five, three, and one. Well. If I call this x, what's one going to be? One minus x. And so I can play you know, similar games as before. And I can say, you know, x would be half the time I'm at eight and I win times one plus half the time I'm now at six. And that's going to be six eighths. Right? Uh, times, yes. Right? So that's going to be um, 8 sixteenths plus 6 sixteenths. Right? Also known as 7 eighths. And so my question to you is, can you make this work for all values of n? So let's say homework for Wednesday. Do all n. So we have not done six and three yet. So the question is, you know, can you, what's the cleanest way to do this? This may not be the best way to do it. It may not be best to do powers of two and then try to fill in, well, what happens if I now give you nine or seven? What do I do about those cases? Maybe it's better to use, I know what's going on for four, now let me try to do five. What I want is I want you to have the experience of something where it's not necessarily clear what to do. You know, a lot of times when you're doing uh, homework problems, how many of you remember the chain rule from calculus? So if you have six problems from the section of the book on the chain rule, what do you think you're going to use to solve those derivatives? And the section on spherical coordinates, what coordinate transformation might surprisingly be useful, right? You know, when you're doing things in a textbook, it's clear what to do. Here, it's not necessarily clear. You know, is it better to keep doing things as powers of two and then somehow figure out what to do for the other stuff? And I did some you know, calculations at breakfast to see how that would go. Or is it better to just try to keep going up in order, you know, the way the integers were given to us? What if you try to do one way and it's just not going well? What should you do? Yeah, I was about to say, this is a math sports. It's not like kicking things like that. You know, this is a sports class. You, know, you can throw a temper tantrum like the athletes. You know, smash things. No, you try the other one. What if neither one works? Then you're in trouble. And you have to come up with a completely different idea. If you've seen the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality, there's a lot of ways to prove it. One of the nice ways of proving it is you prove it for powers of two and then fall down for what you're missing. And so maybe you can prove it for powers of two and then somehow deduce it for other things inside. So I'll leave that as something for you to think about uh, for next Wednesday. So we've got about five minutes left. If anybody wants to come up and talk about what they're doing, um, I'm, I would love to hear people's ideas and thoughts. You, you can share things if you want on the screen. If you just want to speak, that's fine. You know, I want to hear what are people finding as they're doing the double? What are you finding is, are things looking like? 
Does anybody have any results they want to report? You know, I've gotten several emails from people with some results. So. Any rules about when you should maybe double or when you should not double? Yes. So I'm going to just let you speak into the general iPad. Yes. Yeah. No, I feel like one thing I've kind of like found like generally more or less is like, or at least like a question I have that I go into the article I'm not sure about is like, if like if there is a threshold for doubling, if you double at that threshold, like there's like a higher expected value of doubling maybe later because there is a disadvantage of giving up the doubling, giving it to the next person. So I feel like that's kind of like more or less just like a thought or an idea that I have like going forward of like, if you're allowing more and more doubles, like let's say you allow eight doubles in a game, maybe the first one isn't as important, but then like as it goes on, it's not consistent. Like you don't want to consistently double as right. soon as you have an advantage. Kind of like right. No, that, that, that's a great point that the game becomes very different if there's only a finite number of doubles that you don't want to leave things on the table. Um, you're in baseball. I think one of the things that I find that's maybe somewhat similar is you now have this one game do or die playoff. It's counted as the playoffs, right? Yeah. It's not counted as a regular season game. They took it out. They've taken it out. But for a while, they had this one game where if you win, you advance. If not, you go home. And because it's one game, a lot of teams are afraid, well, if we burn our best pitchers in this one game, we're then at a disadvantage when we go to the next series. And I remember one year, the Orioles decided not to use their you know, star closer. They lost, and he was very well vested for the offseason. And you know, this is the problem is, you know, we really need to win this game. But if we win this game in such a way that we kill ourselves for what comes next, it may not be worth it. Uh, does anybody know which professor in this department is a big tennis fan? So Professor Lepp is a big tennis fan. And um, I think my first or second year here, there was a match between Mahmoud and Eisner in Wimbledon. And Wimbledon is a real tennis tournament. They don't have any of this, you know, wimpy, we're gonna have a, uh, alternating, you know, serving back and forth, you know, one long game uh, to determine who wins the, you know, the fifth set, no tiebreaker. You have to win by two games. And it took two days and one of them finally won 71 to 69. It was the longest game ever. It was the longest set ever. The set itself was longer than any other game that had ever been played. It was absurd. And the person who won, what do you think happened to them in their very next game? They lost, you know, they won, but they won in such a way that they just weren't able to compete in the next one. So this idea of if there's only a finite number of doubles, your strategy becomes very different. I guess the other thing, which is way before your time, how many people have taken pictures on a camera or an iPad? How many people have taken pictures where you actually have to physically feed in the film? and decide, is this moment worth a picture? That was my childhood. You know, you have somewhere between six and 24 shots, maybe 36 if it's a really big roll. And do you want to raise to photo on this? Now, I just took 17 pictures and hopefully one of them will be good. I'll take a video and then just take it a still frame from that. So this idea of trying to figure out you know, if there's only finitely many doubles, and this is now where maybe some of the game matters as to how likely is it if you're up by 70, if you have a 70% chance of winning, how likely is it that you're gonna hit the other thresholds? And depending on the model we choose, we could get very different results. So here, I'm doing a very simple model. I think if I have a 70% chance of winning, I think I have as much of a chance of winning as maybe going down to maybe 40%. You're know, moving up the 30, should be as likely as moving down the 30. Other comments? I was wondering um, in the code that you showed and the results, if the doubling threshold was 70%, that's closer to 100 than 30. So I was wondering why the average number of doubles for the games was over one. Um, if, like, if it's statistically more likely that once you've gotten to it, the first double, it is so let me, in the game versus getting to a point where the other player. So double. let me see. Um, so I don't know if I was actually keeping track of the average number of doubles. So I do have the average game value. 
No, oh, this was the average absolute of the game value. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that, that is something that can easily add some lines of code to just keep track of how many doubles have there been. I think that that's, that's de definitely data that we should keep track of. All right, so for next Wednesday, I want people to you know, give me your thoughts about you know, proving that you really do have an 80% chance of winning if you start at 80. Give me your best answers to the back end problem by then. Friday, we're gonna have, I think, a lecture on basketball so that we can fill out our brackets. And then Monday, we have a guest speaker. If people want to come to lunch with a guest speaker, uh, let me just actually stop recording this.